from WAMU 88.5 at American University in Washington. Welcome to this special edition of the Kojo Namdi Show, the At-Large Candidates Forum. I'm Kojo Namdi. Today we're joined in studio by six candidates running for an at-large seat on the D.C. Council in a special election two weeks from tomorrow on April 23rd. But before we meet the candidates, we should take note for a moment of why they're running in the first place and why we're gathered here for a special WAMU 88.5 forum. Last year, Kwame Brown, the chairman of the D.C. Council, stepped down from his position after pleading guilty to a federal crime. Brown left office only months after one of his colleagues on the council, Harry Thomas Jr., left his seat after pleading guilty to federal charges. Brown's departure set off a string of events that eventually left open an at-large seat on the council, hence the special election on April 23rd. The turnover also opened up a flood of new concerns about whether local government in the nation's capital is an ethical enterprise and the degree to which voters in every neighborhood of the city can trust lawmakers are doing their jobs for the benefit of their constituents and not themselves. As such, the first hour of today's conversation will focus completely on issues related to ethics. Joining me to direct traffic and ask questions is Patrick Madden, a WAMU 88.5 news reporter who covers politics. Patrick, Good welcome. Thank you for joining Good us. Good afternoon, Kaojo. You can participate starting now by calling 800-433-8850 or by emailing your questions to kojo at wamu.org. You can tweet us at Kojo Show or post questions to our Facebook page. While we will not be keeping an official clock on the answers of the candidates, we will ask each of them to respect each other's time and to keep their answers brief. And we will remind you that speaking the longest, speaking the loudest for that matter, does not translate into winning or performing best in this forum. So. Allow me to start by introducing each of the candidates in the order in which they're seated around the table. Anita Bonds is a member of the D.C. Council, one of the candidates for the at-large seat up for election. She currently holds the seat. Anita Bonds, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for inviting me. Sitting next to Anita Bonds is Paul Zuckerberg. He is, an, of course, an at-large candidate for this race. Paul Zuckerberg, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Kojo. Thank you for having me. Also with us, former Loose Lips Elissa Silverman running for this seat. Elissa, thank you for joining us. Pleasure to be here, Kojo. Perry Red, he is the Statehood Green Party, can Statehood Green Party candidate. Perry Red, thank you. And thank you, Kojo. Patrick Mera is the Republican candidate for the D.C. Council in this race. Good to see you, Patrick Mera. Good to see you, Kojo. And, of course, Matthew Fruman, last <clears throat> but not least, is a Democratic candidate for this seat. Matthew Fruman, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me, and thank you for having the forum. As I said, we'll take your calls at 800-433-8850. We'll pretend that uh, Bruce Johnson is not in the studio with us, even though he's <laughs> standing right there. A few weeks ago, council members reprimanded one of their own, Jim Graham, <clears throat> over concerns that he improperly mixed his council duties with those of his former position on the Metro Board. Graham has not been charged with a crime, and he has said repe repeatedly that he was only guilty of horse trading, something everyone does without getting too far into the weeds of Graham's case. Where do you draw the line between horse trading and unethical behavior? And as a council member, what standard do you think you and your colleagues should aspire to when it comes to ethics? Did they meet it in the Jim Graham case? Starting with you, Elissa Silverman. Well, Kojo, uh, I've been very clear on the record about this, which is that I think the council should have censured uh, council member Graham. I think reading the investigative reports, it's very uh, clear that there was, uh, that Mr. Graham used his position to um, meddle in contracts. I think that's wrong. Uh, I think that uh, ethics is a platform uh, that I have in this council race. It's one of my three principles, ethics, accountability, uh, and making good investments in our city. Do you think the punishment should have been, could have been more severe? I think the, I think it should have been stronger, yes. Uh, I think that um, the council should have censured Mr. Graham, uh, and I think that um, 
we need to take a strong position because I think the public trust has been broken. I think that's one of the biggest issues that we're facing in our city is that the public trust has been broken and we need to restore it. We need to have confidence that when council members are making decisions, they're making them on behalf of the people and not special interests, not developers who might have contributed to a council member's campaign or to others who um, you know, who have special interest down at the Wilson Building. The pay-to-play culture, I think, has to stop. I'm not going to be necessarily asking each candidate to answer each question. If a candidate feels particularly strongly about an issue about which you have not been asked, please raise your hand and I'll try to recognize this. Also, Patrick Madden, you can jump in at any time. But same question to you, Anita Bond, since you have been sitting on the council for a little while. Have you experienced any of this yet? Um, in fact, I was one of the council members that voted. Voted to, for Century. Yes. That is correct. We voted um, because we uh, felt that uh, Council Member Graham went a bit too far. Um, there is something called horse trading, but when you get into the weeds and you actually um, indicate to one party that if you do this, then I'll do that, then we think that's going too far. And that's where we took issue with um, Council Member Graham and that's his right. behavior. Anita, if I can just follow up because it's Part of this is also contributions from developers. I know, mm -hmm. uh, I think it was March 8th, you, your campaign or your council office put out a newsletter where you talked about how you co-introduced a bill that would ban contributions made by limited liability companies. These are sort of subsidiary companies that business uh, folks, developers can often use to make multiple donations. Mm -hmm. Two days later, though, your campaign finance report came out and it showed thousands of dollars in campaign cash including at least a half a dozen of these LLCs. Mm -hmm. So on this question, which position do you take on, on these limited liability companies? Do you take the one in your newsletter or the one in your campaign finance report? Well, you know, limited uh, liability companies are entities. The problem is that we uh, currently do are not required to disclose the ownership of these liabilities and I'm comfortable as long as the ownership of these liability companies is disclosed and so I'm very happy to provide that information uh, because it's not currently required by law but I think we need a law that does require that. Patrick Mayor? Yes thank you uh, with regard to Councilmember Graham I represent Ward 1 on the DC State Board of Education so we have the same constituency I did send out Get a, close to the oh, microphone. pardon me. I did uh, send out I was the first candidate in this race to send out a release uh, stating my strong concerns. I believe what should have happened, I believe we should have had a hearing. We missed an opportunity to te really to test ethics reform. I think as happened, I think probably he also he should have been censured, uh, but I also believe that he should have been stripped from his committee chair, but then all his committees and then he would have we would have set a precedent for ethics reform because it seems to me to a certain extent we swept it under the rug. He is your council member. Would you could you vote for him again for re-election? Um, I did not vote for him last time. Well, you are Wait, there are several people who want to <laughs> respond to this some more, but Perry Red has not yet had a chance as yet. Uh, he is the state of Green candidate. Indeed, indeed. Thank you very much, Koto. Uh, you know, uh, this whole thing I, I don't do dancing. I, I'm a songwriter. And so this whole thing about LLCs, it sounds like Mitt Romney. You know, corporations are people, my friend. And it, we cannot allow that. And that's one of the reasons why, as a party principal, uh, D.C. statehood greens do not take corporate donations, nor do we take donations that are bundled. Uh, those kind that come from corporations that disguise as people. So what we want to do about that is, uh, if indeed we're elected on April 23rd, to uh, implement what we call an open source solution, where you're able to see every phone call we make, every meeting that we have, every dealing that we have as council, and it's transparent and accessible to the people, either online or they can go down to 441 to view it um, in a platform there. Something different, something right. I don't do dancing. I'm a songwriter. What's sure. That? Well, <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, yeah. Cal Councilman Bonds talked about the, the the position. Well, Patrick alluded to the position on one side, and then we're seeing something different. And so we have to be consistent on the council, and that's one of the things I look to do is to gain the confidence of the people and not dance around the issues. Okay. Here's Matthew Fruman. 
Yeah, the kind of horse trading that was at issue here, we can't tolerate that both as a as protecting against corruption and protecting against the perception of corruption. We really need to build people's confidence in our city government and it is down and this is an episode that keeps pushing it down. Now one of the things about this is the council approves contracts over a certain size and that is a kind of attractive nuisance. It invites the kind of horse trading that you had here. It invites a tendency to favor political con contributors. I think we need to move away from that. I think we need to uh, pass the pay to play legislation that Attorney General Irv Nathan has come forward with. Let's take bold steps to show that we're not going to tolerate this kind of thing. You want going to get forward. the council out of the business of approving contracts completely? I like oversight over the contract process, but not the approval of the large contracts. Yes, in case you're just mm -hmm. joining us, this is a special WAMU 885 production of the Kojo Namdi show in which we're talking to all of the candidates for the at large seat on the DC Council in the election later this month and our co-moderator is Patrick Madden. He's a reporter for WAMU 88.5. We're taking your calls at 800-433-8850 or you can send email to code at WAMU.org. We haven't heard your voice yet, Paul Zuckerberg. Thank you. I'm Paul Zuckerberg and I find that uh, Councilman Graham's explanation that this is just business as usual uh, in the council is more telling than anything else because it is business as usual. We have lobbyists outside the council, we have lobbyists inside the council, and we have money from lobbyists and developers controlling the agenda at the council. I believe if you are a lobbyist or if you represent someone who transacts business with the District of Columbia, you're not qualified to sit on the council. I am the only candidate who's actually running on a platform that's against his own personal interest. Uh, my livelihood is defending people on marijuana cases, and if elected, I want to decriminalize marijuana. I want to put myself out of business. Uh, I'm not running on my own personal interest, but for what's good for the citizens. Allow me to go to the telephones. Here is Jared in Washington, D.C. Jared, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Yes, hi. Um, I just had a question with regard well, to, to all the candidates, open to all the candidates, and what I wanted to know was where each candidate saw a distinction lies between um, playing, playing politics and uh, crossing the ethical barrier. Because it seems to me that a fundamental element of the political game and political game theory is having clout. And part of that is, uh, is, is contrib or participating in the favored game. Uh, I'm not a politician, but I am a, a graduate of GW and I have a degree in political science. And... I'm from Chicago, Illinois, so you know that may be just from where I'm coming from. But where does that distinction lie? It is a settlement. Where does that distinction lie? For you, Jim Graham said that. Look, I didn't do anything illegal. Where do you draw the line between playing politics and outright unethical behavior? So, Kojo, I think that this LLC issue is a clear distinction <coughs> between the candidates. I, I know I'm sure listeners are wondering, well, where are the differences? You know. We are looking for people to lead reform efforts in our city and to restore confidence in our government. Now, I have taken a pledge not to accept. I was one of the leaders of Initiative 70, the grassroots effort to ban corporate contributions in our local politics. Both you and Patrick covered that issue very thoroughly, and I thank you for it. And I think it demonstrates my efforts to be a leader in reform in that I was involved with Initiative 70. I feel very strongly that money is part of our problem in local politics, the role of money in politics, and I've applied it to my own campaign. So I'm not taking corporate money. I'm not taking PAC money either. And I think that says something about someone's leadership skills. Patrick. And just to follow up on that, Matt. Alyssa, what, what about donations directly from the developers themselves, the individuals. I know Neil Albert has given money to you, uh, Sinclair Skinner, who's done contracting work. Is that then a double standard? Do you draw a line there? No, I don't think it's a double standard. I, I think we have very polarizing debates in our city that we need to get beyond to move forward. You know, there's debates about the war on cars versus the war on cyclists and about developers and anti-development. I don't think those are constructed debates. I think we need to move forward as a city with sensible, reasonable 
policies. I've received, con you know, my deep pocketed contributors are of many stripes. They're from all over the city. They're from every ward. There are people in Ward 5 from Miriam's Kitchen. There are lawyers uh, from the Washington Legal Clinic. And yes, there are people like Neil Albert, our former city administrator. And you know, what I think is interesting, Patrick, and of course what's odd for me to be in this race is that many of the folks who've contributed to me, I've covered as a reporter, and, and even my chairman, Kathy Patterson, the former Ward 3 council member, said that sometimes I didn't write the most flattering things even about her, but I was always fair and but accurate what if and somebody honest. like Sinclair Skinner, who makes a contribution to you, is coming as the head of a company after, if you were to get elected to the council, he's coming and the, he's, he's, he, has, he does business with the city, he has a contract with the city. How would you act in that situation? So here's what I think is really interesting about the Sinclair Skinner contribution, Kojo, is that I was the first reporter to write about Sinclair and to write not flattering things about Sinclair either. And when I received that contribution from him, because I get a little indication on my email, I wrote to Sinclair and I said, Sinclair, why did you give me a contribution? And he said, look, I want district government to move forward and you have always been fair and accurate and honest and your agenda has been a reform agenda to improve district government and that's my agenda too and that's why I'm giving to you. If, if I but could, you didn't answer my question. I think I answered your question. If, if, if St. Clair Skinner's company applies for a contract that the council has to approve, how would you act in that situation, given that he's a campaign contributor of you? On the, on the merits, Kojo, I mean, I have been a, a data-driven person, an information-driven person, I think. I've been on your program as an analyst before, and I've always approached everything through information and data, and that's how I would be as a council member. The council did move last year to pass a so-called ethics reform bill. Since you're getting ready to speak, Paul Zuckerberg, what did you think of it? What do you think it says about the council's ability to police itself? Well, the reform bill was totally toothless, and it's irrelevant because it doesn't get to real reform. But I just want to say, because this has come up several times, you know, my signatures were challenged by Miss Silverman. Across the table from me at four hearings was one of the largest corporate law firms, an LLC, uh, which must have donated tens of thousands of dollars to Miss Silverman's campaign. That's not on any of her financial disclosure forms. Uh, that's probably the single largest corporate contribution or LLC co contribution in this campaign was accepted by Miss Silverman uh, from this law firm. And I wonder, and this law firm's a, a firm which uh, transact business and lobbies with the District of, of Columbia on behalf of its clients. So uh, really it's disingenuous to say you don't accept corporate contributions when you've accepted I'm gonna more. I'm going to have to ask Ms. Silverman to keep her answer brief because she's already dominating too much of the conversation. So Kojo, let me Kojo. address this challenge issue, which is that uh, the challenge was actually made by a supporter of mine and I checked with the Office of Campaign Finance and my campaign actually could not under our rules, under our campaign finance rules, pay for that. Uh, any How much of legal, legal work services. did it do for you? How much? Give me the dollar amount wow. of the legal work that that LLC did for you, and that you accepted In ten words or less. and never it's disclosed. And if you check with OCF, Paul, in my campaign did, we were not allowed to pay for it. I was happy did to do so. Did you disclose it? Did Allow me to move anyone? on. Here no. is Neil in Washington D.C. Neil, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Hi there. Uh, thank you very much for taking my call. My uh, question is directed towards Councilmember Bonds. You work full time for Fort Meyer Construction. They're one of the largest contractors to the city. My question is do you recuse yourself from votes, budget issues, and lobbying fellow council members on every single thing concerning Fort Meyer's construction? I need a bonds. Um, firstly, I am on. Um a leave of absence from Fort Myer, but since I have been on the council, anytime anything has come before me related to Fort Myer, I have recused myself, and the votes of the council will indicate such. Um, the question, of course, is likely to come up later, so I might as well ask it now. If you are elected to the council, will you quit your job? Yes. Unequivocal. Unequivocal. Without a shadow of a doubt. All of that. Let and the more. record show. Please let the record show. <laughs> I, I have said it a number of times, and it, 
just doesn't seem to resonate. You seem you know, to have a question, Patrick. Oh, I just wanted to pose the same one to Matt over there because I know you've been asked that before, and I, I, I think you self-described the uh, the answer as murky. So, so can you describe your outside employment this question situation, from Matthew Fuman, and what you will do? If, yeah, well, when I started this campaign, first and foremost, I'm a dad, and I was trying to think, how do I make sure that I have maintain all of my relationships? And I thought, well, I want to be able to look to see after the election how it can operate. I would never tolerate a conflict. I would never tolerate being in a position where I couldn't give my all to this job. Since that has happened, I've gone back, I've talked to my colleagues, I've told them I will unequivocally not go back to my work, not have any association with my law firm should I win this election. So I will not have any kind of outside affiliation. I do, though, want to go back to the question that was asked before about where's the line that you were talking about, and others have commented. And, and the line is, what is the public good? If you get yourself into a situation where you may be favoring someone, either because their LLC gave you a contribution or they as individuals or groups of individuals gave you a contribution, then you're over the line if you're favoring those people. And if you get yourself into a position where you're compromised like that and you're describing it in the press as horse trading, you're way over the line. So we need to get at this, but just banning LLC contributions doesn't do it for the kinds of reasons that you raised. You need to have an eye on what, what is happening with the individuals as well, which is why the bill proposed by the Attorney General, which gets at contributions from contractors and potential contractors, does a better job of protecting us going forward from the kind of pay-to-play culture that we've suffered from. Neil, thank you very much for your call. Patrick Mara, I have said in the past that there seem to be some former members of the council who joined the council because the salary provided would provide them an upgrade in lifestyle because they couldn't really do any or they didn't really have any other jobs. And now we're involved in the debate of whether or not people should have outside jobs at all. What's wrong with having an outside job if you're on the council? Sure. I, I mean, I've always said that uh, being on the council, it should be your full-time job. Why? And I will treat it as that. It's it's a citywide, first of all, particularly when you're an outlaw, member it's a citywide position you need to you need to get around to all eight wards just about every day of the week if not every day of the week and I do not now know how an individual would have time to do some type of other employment opportunity um, one of the things that's deeply concerned me about those other employment opportunities has been when they are with uh, contractors that do business with the District of Columbia um, I've also seen issues where um, you know, even even now, everyone is now saying that they're not doing outside employment. But at the beginning of the campaign, mm -hmm. um, they were saying they were they were participating in out, outside employment. So um, we see this over and over again, where a, a group of people who are running for an office say, "I'm not doing, I'm not taking outside employment," and then it comes time for their their job on the council, and what do you know? They're taking outside employment. And and Pat, just to follow up on that, what is the status of? I know you. You have a consulting firm, a lobbying yes. firm. Yes. So I have what I uh, I have not done any uh, government affairs since 2008. Um, but then I was a consultant to some small businesses outside the District of Columbia. And can you and 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 before that, you were a lobbyist on from, Capitol uh, Hill. Uh, I I did government affairs on Capitol Hill from uh, 2001 through September 30th, 2008. Perry Red, why would you not keep a separate job if you were allowed to serve on the council? Allow me to underscore the point I made earlier. If this is your only job, your only source of income, some people will say you'll do whatever is necessary to protect it, including taking money under the table and anything else to protect it, because you don't have any other way of making a living. First of all, let me say this, that since the beginning of the campaign, and, and Patrick Mayer made a great point, that at the beginning of the campaign, there were different positions. This is where I alluded to earlier about dancing, because that's what we're doing. And you obviously are, 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 you have some power to cleanse the spirit here, because a lot of positions are changing right here at this table. So I've said since the beginning of the campaign that Washington, D.C. has the second highest paid city council in the country. And if indeed we won't pay our 
see workers a living wage, then why would we even consider uh, allowing city council people to hold a second job making uh, well in excess of $125,000 a year? Okay, the median household income in, in, in the city is $61,000. The poverty line is $22,000. We won't even pass a living wage in this city, and we're proposing through the Large Retail Accountability Act a uh, living wage or this, uh, living wage of 1175 75 that's just so that it reaches the poverty level so like President Obama did last week he said he'd give back 5% of his salary to stand in solidarity with those who've been uh, suffering from the sequester I am the only candidate who committed from the beginning of the campaign to take a part-time salary for this part-time job 800-433-8850 is the number to call. In case you missed it earlier, you can send us a tweet at Kojo Show, or you can join us on our Facebook page. You can also go to our website, kojoshow.org, to ask a question or make a comment. Patrick Mayer, last week, Washington City paper Loose Lips columnist Alan Suderman wrote that in 2008, business interests were eager to get rid of former council member Carol Schwartz and threw their weight behind you in the primary when you defeated her. What would you say to that? Is that a well, correct statement? I would say the correct statement is, you know, I was focused on education reform and school choice. I went around and I knocked on 8,000 doors in a primary. No one had ever done that before from just about 3 o'clock every weekday afternoon to, to about 8 o'clock in the evening and then on the weekends from 11 to 7 o'clock and I had a conversation with voters. I Basically, the only other person who had visited these folks previously would be former Mayor Adrian Fenty, and we talked about education reform. We talked about D.C. public charter schools, and we also spoke about the Opportunity Scholarship Program, and that is what put me over in that primary in 2008. The perception that follows from the assertion that I made earlier, or that the assertion that others made, is that you should be seen as the business candidate in this race. Are you? I don't I don't think so. Obviously, I'm very pro-small business because entrepreneurship is something we should be encouraging in the district. As you know, we're number 51, according to some indexes, uh, which is not good when we have 50 states in the union. Um, but, you know, I'm, you know, I'm endorsed by the Sierra, the D.C. Sierra Club, the current newspapers, the Washington Post. Um, so I have a, a wide range of organizations and individuals who support me. And, Patrick Madden? And, and Pat, obviously you've earned uh, a slew of endorsements, but you've, you're obviously, you've been criticized because of the, the R next to your name, right? Because you're the Republican in this race. So, question for you, how are you different from the National Republican Party? What, where are the specific differences that you have with them? Thank you for that question. Well, as you know, I am I'm socially progressive, fiscally responsible, moderate, uh, I came to D.C. to work for the late Senator John Chafee, who's of that, that Rockefeller Republican breed. And, uh, you know, I was leading the fight on marriage equality on the Republican side several years ago. I was the only one in this entire room right now who testified before the D.C. Council. And I was the only one advocating uh, for Congress to leave marriage equality through to people who are among probably the most conservative members of Congress in America. I've also been up on the Hill, you know, voting for, fighting for voting rights, state, statehood budget autonomy, um, and I've been meeting with the key, key players that nobody else is meeting with. And I think for our purposes of really making ourselves not second, third class citizens in the District of Columbia, we need to have some form of engagement that isn't necessarily a protest because you'd, amazed, you'd be amazed at how on either side of the aisle there's just a complete lack of awareness of what our situation is in the district. And we've actually, in the D.C. and the local party, we now have marriage equality in the party platform. We have full voting representation in the party platform. So we are really creating an urban model for the nation. And you know we're the you know we're the type of uh, you know more more of a progressive Republican Party. In case you're just joining us, this is a special edition of the Kojo Namdi Show, talking to all of the candidates for the at-large seat on the D.C. Council. We're talking with Anita Bonds, who currently holds the seat. She's running as a Democrat. Matthew Fruman is running as a Democrat. Patrick Mara is a Republican candidate. Perry Red is a statehood Green Party candidate. Alyssa Silverman is a Democratic candidate, as is Paul Zuckerberg, all running for the at-large seat on the D.C. Council. You can call us at 800-433-8850. It's not like the council or the D.C. government is playing with monopoly money and not all of the ways the city distributes that money on programs are easy to follow. Harry Thomas, Jr., 
was caught embezzling money earmarked for youth sports programs that went through the public-private Children's Youth Investment Trust. This is an organization that's been responsible over time for more than a hundred million dollars of public money. As a council member, what do you think will be the most important aspects of your job when it comes to oversight of the money, and what policies do you think could be put in place to guard against the creation, well, of slush funds, Alyssa Silverman? Oh, I think the major role of the council uh, is oversight. And, you know, I have, I'd say of the candidates sitting here, I have been the one to drill down into the budget and take a look at how we're spending our money. You know, I, before me right now, as I'm showing to you and Patrick, is something that I worked on that I think Patrick reported on, which was a workforce development map. This is a map of where we spend all of our dollars on job training. And, you know, what do we know? Well, we spend a lot of money and we don't have good outcomes. And I think the role of the council member is really to press the agencies on why are we not getting better outcomes? How can we shift our dollars to get better outcomes and repeat and pull information and data to improve those outcomes? Anita Bond, same um, question. I, I'd, I'd like to add to um, Alyssa's um, opinion here because it's more than just doing the due diligence and looking at the budget and looking at numbers and talking to um, the administrators. It's also about talking to the recipients of the services and talking to the community. You'd be surprised at what community thinks we ought to be doing with the budget and how we should spend the money. And it's not always the way it is perceived. Uh, for instance, when you talk to senior citizens, they want relief. They want relief. Those who are taxpayers, they want to pay less or not at all, if, particularly if you're 80 years or older and you're still, you know, having to complete your um, so-called personal um, income tax. Um, um, and and. It is also a situation where you have our young people who really feel that they become the throwaway persons in our society. And when you talk to their parents, they're wondering, how are we really going to improve things? Well, talk to me and get some opinions from me, a parent who is here every day. It's our pocketbooks that make a difference. And so I just think we have to look at this uh, role of a council person a little differently. In modern society, it's more than just the numbers. It's more than just the data. It is also about the human side of the equation. We represent people. We're elected people. Um, we're not uh, elected by the numbers. We're elected by the human beings. And just to quickly follow up, Anita, would you bring back the earmarking system that the council used to have and that caused a lot of controversy? It caused a lot of controversy and no, I would not bring that back. I think that there are some um, um, new systems that we can put in place. I think when citizens talk, uh, when citizens speak at forums, etc., I think we have to listen more. For instance, um, we'll always get a, a, a be besieged with, you know, lobbying by community on any particular issue but I really think when you go around to the community and and you start talk, talking about a subject that you may want to discuss suddenly you'll discover well everyone is concerned about speed cameras. Matthew Fuhrman what do you see for what use do you see for and you can add whatever you wanted to say before but what use do you see for constituent service funds? Uh, okay, but I do. I, I did want to chime into this chime, other debate chime because uh, the oversight is the absolute key. And frankly, I think I've been involved in both sides of the coin that Alyssa Silverman and Councilmember Bounds, Bounds are talking about. In my world of advocacy around schools, we did the Wilson modernization. We dug into every aspect of that modernization, looking at the plans, looking at the costs, working with the teachers, working with the students to try to figure out how we could do this best, how it could work best for the school, the city, and the community. Same thing on school budgets citywide. Mary Levy is a bigger expert on school budgets than I, but I would posit there aren't that many other ones who are that much more of an expert you need to dig in. You need to be talking with people on all sides of it. Constituent service funds can play a role in meeting the needs of people in the greatest need, but to the extent that they become or appear to become slush funds, we shouldn't have them. If we're going to have them, 
every donation needs to be transparent every use of the money needs to be transparent and the money needs to be limited just to things like paying utility bills for seniors that are having trouble never tickets and things like that for athletic events Perry Red you wanted to say mm. you know I I proposed uh, when indeed we're elected on April 23rd an open source solution and that would would make transparent and accessible um, all, all of our, our, our the council's work whether it comes to contracts and grants whether it comes to constituent service allocations because I'd like to bring that back you know I think it's a moratorium on it or something like that but but the chief mechanism for ensuring that uh, um, uh, the council people do the right thing for the right reasons is this is that uh, what we plan on doing is having citizen-led legislative drafting because your original question was about the council's role in money and so we have to to, to legislate we'll, we'll be lawmakers and uh, we talk about oversight quite often and that's totally necessary but we have to have citizens included in the process in writing laws that they want to see passed. So I, I would say the chief role in terms of money is legislating, allocating responsibly and such, and of course with the oversight, allowing the people to tell the story as well. Patrick Mara, you and then Alyssa Silverman specifically on the use you see for constituent service funds. Sure, they are as somebody has noted in the past, or we've all noted in the past, these are these are really their big slush funds. I think to to use the excuse to use these funds to pay for utility bills, the, it's very difficult to means test a situation uh, paying for utility bills. This, these are the types of activities that should be handled in the executive through specific programs, so that we can identify true need. And I think right now, constituent services funds are primarily more for political. Purposes. Purposes. You'd get it's, rid of them altogether? I'd like to get rid of them altogether. Mm. Alyssa mm. Silverman? So I think this is where oversight is, plays a role because when you look at how constituent service funds have been used, they haven't largely been used for helping people with funeral assistance and rent assistance and utility assistance. They've been used for other things. Now, when Councilmember Grasso was elected in November, he uh, appointed me or asked me to lead a task force for him on ethics. And one of the things we suggested is getting rid of privately raised constituent service funds because it's just a means to buy access to the council. What we alternatively suggested, and this was part of a group exercise, is that there will be a line item in the budget for the council to that all council members can access to use for those real emergency needs like rent assistance, like utility assistance, and that there be parameters put on the use uh, of those funds. Mm -hmm. Patrick, um, oh, well, oh, wait a oh, minute. But let, I actually, let me, let, let me address what Anita um, talked about, which is, you know, one of the first things that I did when I got to the DC Fiscal Policy Institute was opened up the budget negotiations to the public. You know, I do, uh, one of the, my main aims as a reporter and as uh, a budget analyst has been getting the public more involved in the most important decisions that we make. So before, as you, as you both know, uh, when we got down to the last weeks of the budget, those key decisions, those key decisions about our priorities as a city were made behind closed doors. And I led a coalition of groups to actually open that up to the public so the public can see how decisions are made. I think the public, getting the public involved is very important because part of the problem down at the Wilson Building is it's sort of a 13-member exclusive club. And then just to follow up with that, do you think that your work with the Fiscal Policy Institute that that uh, organization should be registered at, as a lobbyist with the city considering all the advocacy work that it does well you know this is a, I actually agree with that uh, and I, I do think we should be registered as a lobbyist yes and just a, another lobbyist question um, uh, lobbyists as fundraisers now I know I was uh, Anita I was checking out your schedule later this week you're meeting with David Wilmont mm -hmm. Who is one Who's of the it? one of the top lobbyists in DC? Mm -hmm. Represents Walmart, pharma mm -hmm. uh, pharmaceutical, beverage I mean, industries, and you're and this happens every campaign. AT candidates, everyone, yeah. candidates have fundraisers with lobbyists. Mm -hmm. Do you think that is a problem, and do you think that contributes to any of the problems we're seeing today? The problem of perception, particularly. 
Perception, yes. How about the real, real reality of it? Let's talk to the reality of it. Forget perception. I need a balance. All right. Thanks a lot. <laughs> okay. The reality of it is it probably is... Um, Perceptionally, it is a issue because we've been talking um, this afternoon a lot about you know corruption and this whole arena of what is ethical, what is not. But the reality is that lobbyists are individuals who, like anyone else who is a voter in the District of Columbia, expresses their opinion. The the, the side of the coin I think we have to be concerned with is what does the elected official do with that lobbyist and with the funds that come in through a lobbyist effort. And the funds that come in through the lobbyist effort go for everything that you usually use on a campaign. Nothing extraordinary for the mailings, et cetera, et cetera. The um, input that you get from a lobbyist is the financial wherewithal in order to do a campaign. Campaigns are expensive. Um, consultants cost. Um, paper is expensive as we all know. So I'm really saying that because a lobbyist contributes to your campaign does not mean that you're where the lobbyist is. And the lobbyist is not necessarily trying to buy you. The lobbyist is saying, hey, you know, I like what I see and I think that you look like a winner. You know in the District of Columbia everyone wants to be with a winner, you know, first and foremost. And so that has a lot to do with the perception that you're getting out there. The perception of David Wilmot is that he is an he is the ultimate insider in Washington. He is not only a lobbyist, he does contracts with the city. He's been known to be friendly with former mayors of the of the city. When you are going to an event that is sponsored by somebody like David Wilmot, it only increases the perception that he is indeed the ultimate insider. Don't you have to take some extra steps to prove that this is not going to influence what you do? Because frankly, everybody around this table knows that name because everybody says that's the go-to guy in this city. Uh, most definitely, um, David Wilmot is the go-to guy in many circles. You're correct about that. That's a that's a fair perception, but also David Wilmot and whatever his enterprises are um, will require seven votes on the council. I would be one of seven votes if I were voting on any measure that related to his enterprises, and so that's that that would be my that would be my my consideration. I think as a member of the council, you are all you have to always remember that you're under the the glass dome and that what you do certainly gives the impression to people as to what your thinking is about the community. I'm hearing mumbled responses of shock no. and horror on this side of the table oh, okay. coming from, it looks like, Patrick Mayer. <laughs> well, I was just wow. a, a little surprised that you said you would be one of seven votes for David Wilmot, and that just that surprised me. Oh, no, I'm not saying that. I said in order for David Wilmont to get anything through the council, he needs seven votes, you know, majority of the votes. So, so he just has to buy seven right, council exactly. members and seven one. So, and I'm sure he can afford to do that. Listen, uh, I've been asked to met with lobbyists. Do you I was, making a contribution as, uh, as buying a council member? Well, I've told developers and lobbyists that they are free to contribute to my campaign. But in exchange, they're going to get bupkis. And they looked up that word, a Yiddish word in the dictionary, and it means <laughs> beans or nothing. So and have they after, been contributing heavily to your campaign? Well, you can look at my sheet. You're going to see I haven't received one contribution from either a lobbyist or a developer. It's pay to play. They're not giving. I'm not so vain to think that they would give to me because they like the way I look or like any of my programs. They're buying influence. And once I told them that I'm not selling influence, uh, they've gone elsewhere. So I have none. As far as well, oversight... Let me ask somebody who's raised yeah. a lot of money, Matthew <laughs> Fruman. What is your position on this? People feel that you've raised a significant amount of money from people who might be in a position to influence you. Well, I've raised, I've raised a fair amount of money from many, many people from different perspectives. And I think I've raised the money that I've ra raised because people believe I do a good job and I'm fair. I've raised money from people who have supported different projects and people who have opposed different projects. I think our our main thing on the council 
is you need to go out and raise money from people who believe in you, not because you're going to do something for them, but because they see you see a record of a, accomplishment, and then you need to behave honorably going forward. One of the things that we can do in this area, though, is the kind of campaign finance reform that has been proposed to try to make it so that lower dollar donations are more important. You can involve, include matching of low dollar donations. The idea that people are bought for the kinds of donations that are made now, I don't think that's the case. I think it is the case when you get into bundling, when you get into the kind of multiple LLCs, but we can protect our system from the perception of corruption by making lower dollar donations more important so people do not believe that people are being bought. Patrick Madden. And just on the issue of lobbyists, I know, Pat, I mentioned this to you before, but you used to work on the Hill as a lobbyist, and I know you dispute the House lobbying report that says you worked for Exxon Yes. and, and a Las Vegas Casino. Yes. Yes, I do. Can you talk about sort of what your experience on the Hill as a lobbyist in regards to this whole discussion and sort of what what experience that, that has given you to become a, a council member? Sure, it's given me a, a very unique perspective because I was able to observe the whole Abramoff situation and what that did and you could kind of see how he was he was seriously influencing people and I do believe you know right now we really don't do a good job in the Wilson building of, of monitoring things like uh, gifts uh, lunches, dinners. I mean, how many, how many of things, uh, how many of these things are undisclosed by council members? Uh, I think that we probably do need something like almost a, a law that would limit it to not even a cup of coffee, um, because I, it seems to me there are people who are receiving gifts and other forms of contributions. You know, free legal work, as that came up before. I mean, these are the types of things that we have to be taking a harder look. But we are so far back on where we should be. We need to, we need to be a, we need to evolve in a way where we're a much more a cleaner, open, more open DC government. And some of this, oddly enough, we can almost. I, I was talking to a member of Congress, and they were asking me, "Well, why do I don't understand why people have outside jobs?" And this was so, this was so foreign. And so I, we we have a long ways to go in terms of what we do, not only from the contributor standpoint but on the lobbying side as well. We only have a few minutes left in this first hour and I'd like to use it in a slightly different way. If I were to ask you, Elissa Silverman, one question that you would most like to ask another panelist in this discussion, who would that question be addressed to and what would it be? I would ask uh, Mr. Mara uh, you know, why he remains in the Republican Party if he is in says that he's a progressive uh, and that he's independent minded why he remains in the Republican Party when someone else in our city who was a Republican who felt like the party did no longer represented him on social issues uh, and uh, David Catania exactly uh, decided to actually leave the party respond to the former well, absolutely there, you know there's two things you can do you can either just drop out or you can change things. And what I've done is I've completely started to change things because I said before, we now have marriage equality in our platform. We have full voting representation in our party platform. Um, you know, and I've done things that have upset people. You know, for example, I endorsed Sekou Biddle in the Democratic, par Democratic primary a year ago because I saw this vote split thing happening. I am not, while I am a socially progressive, fiscally responsible, moderate Republican, um, I don't have a problem with being bipartisan. I don't have a problem with working with, with others. And uh, look, I am that that socially progressive urban Republican, and we're starting something new here. We're kind of setting an example for the rest of the nation. Anita Bonds, what question would you like to put to another panelist in this discussion, and who would that be? I think I'd like to ask uh, Ms. Silverman a question about her um, progressiveness. Um, she has made it very clear to voters that she's the progressive candidate, and I'd like to know what, what definition is she using um, to be the progressive candidate when their Democrats have traditionally been progressives. So I think it's, uh, thanks for the question, Anita, I think it's supporting things like paid sick leave, being very clear that I believe that workers in our city deserve to have a day off when they feel sick. And that's a difference, I think, between many of the folks at this table. Uh, this came up before, and 
as you mentioned, Kojo. Uh, the Republican primary in 2008 was largely revolved around this issue of paid sick days. Uh, and um, Mr. Mayor won that uh, primary over Carol Schwartz, who supported a paid sick days law. Now there is an exemption in that law, which exempted uh, tip restaurant workers. And I support uh, amending that law to include tip restaurant workers because I believe people who serve our food deserve to have a day off when they're not feeling sick and that they shouldn't be fired for it. And also I think it's a public health issue. I also support the living wage bill uh, that Perry Red talked about earlier, which is uh, requiring big box stores to pay a living wage that can support their the families. Implication, That's what I believe Anita Bonds, is that you don't support paid sick leave and I'm that listening. you don't support the living I'm wage. I'm listening. And I have gone on record in support of living wage and sick leave. Yes. So that's why I was a little confused. So Matthew Truman asked somebody a question. Yes. Well, mine's a little more specific. I thought I saw a reference, Pat, to Pat Mara, that you had contributed $999 to the Romney campaign, and it puzzled me. Why 999 and why Mitt Romney over Barack Obama? But most important, the 999 Patrick oh. Mara. Oh, everyone is is engaging me in the discussion today. Well, I mean, this is this is kind of what it's been you. like for the last few weeks because you know I've just been focused on talking with voters, focusing on my message of education reform, being that fiscal and ethical watchdog on the council. You're not going to answer uh, that question, are you? I mean, everyone is everyone is sending out emails, <laughs> fundraising on my behalf. I mean, it's absolutely it's absolutely amazing, and they just want to make me out to be this monster, but I'm not. Um, I'm always going to do what's in the best interest of the District of Columbia. Now, look, I supported the guy who lost. I don't know that there's anyone in the district who believed that uh, President Obama would fall short in D.C. Uh, and like I said before, we're trying to really make this an urban model. Um, you know, I've always admired folks like Cory Booker and Michael Bloomberg, and we're doing something different in the District of Columbia. And I've been a, you know, I've been, like I've said before, I've been a leading advocate on the board of D.C. vote uh, to make sure that. You know, we we change their things here in the district, and that we're not second, third class citizens. Got to take a break. They're all here, and they will be back next hour. Anita Bonds, Matthew Fruman, Patrick Mira, Perry Red, Alyssa Silverman, Paul Zuckerberg, I, my co-moderator Patrick Madden of WMU 88.5 News, and yours truly. We'll continue this debate next hour for the at-large seat on the D.C. City Council. On the D.C. Council, mm -hmm. I'm Kojo Nandi.
From WMU 88.5 at American University in Washington, welcome to the Kojo Nandi Show, connecting your neighborhood with the world in this special forum with the candidates for the at-large race on the D.C. Council, which takes place on April 23rd. Of course, absentee balloting starts today, April 8th, and joining us in studio is Paul Zuckerberg. Alyssa Silverman, she's a Democratic candidate. Perry Red is a statehood Green Party candidate. Patrick Mara is a Republican candidate. Matthew Fruman, Democratic candidate. Anita Bonds, Democratic candidate. She currently holds that seat that's up for election on April 23rd. And Patrick Madden is our co-moderator. He's a reporter who covers D.C. politics for WAMU 88.5. You can call us, but the lines are busy, so you may want to send an email to kojo at wamu.org, a tweet at Kojo Show, or simply join the conversation by going to our website, kojoshow.org. Speaking of joining, joining us in studio but not allowed to speak is Bruce Johnson of Channel 9, <laughs> who's causing an intense amount of jealousy from one Tom Sherwood of NBC4. <laughs> but they don't get to speak, Patrick Madden, you do. That's right. Well, I guess um, this hour we're going to talk about growth in the city and all the different things that that means, gentrification, the changing demographics, and what, what council members, the role of the council managing all of this stuff. There are few issues that affect every Washingtonian as much as the growth of the city that Patrick just mentioned. The changes D.C. has seen in the past few decades have been well documented. New residents, new businesses have flooded the district block by block, neighborhood by neighborhood. But in many people's eyes, that growth is threatening to displace as many people as it will benefit. And it remains to be seen how much local government can do about it. We're focusing on that in this hour. Back to you, Patrick Madden. So the first question, uh, question I want to ask, it was in today's Washington Post, and it was the article on the... Um, on this race, and it, it was a statement from the local AFSCME leader, uh, and it was very interesting. And it basically it was talking about his support, uh, his support for uh, you and Nita, and also AFSCME, I guess, had been supporting Michael Brown, and now they're supporting your campaign. And the question was, it was basically the supporters said the perception of that the city is be what the city is becoming, and that they want um, this council to remain black. That that was the sort of that was the quote in this in this uh, in the paper this morning. I just sort of wanted you to, to respond to that notion and and about whether the council um, should be representative people of who live in this district. Well, definitely the council should be representative of the people who live in the district of Columbia. And um, being a black woman, um, I'm happy to hear that comment. Quite honestly, I would be foolish not to. In want to enjoy of, of the comment. Um, the reality of the District of Columbia is that you know we are growing by leaps and bounds. We're the most desired community in the nation. Um, we're, we're flush with cash as you know. We, we have sustained um, budget uh, surpluses for the past few years and will continue through uh, FY um, uh, 2017 most likely. Um, it makes the district the place to be and there are, this region is flushed also with 300,000 jobs and when young people from other parts of the country come to DC they come with a job in hand so this makes it very exciting but it also adds fear um, in the neighborhoods um, across the city because you think well okay if if my property taxes continue to go up I'll be priced out of the city um, if I I cannot find a place to live because I do not earn an income for uh, $2,500 for a one-bedroom or a two-bedroom. It's a problem. And so I think one of the things that the council has to do is to be there with the community and try to work um, sort of like chipping away at what you see progress to be, but at the same time letting progress grow and flourish. And it's, it's, it's a balance, striking a balance and working with the citizenry so that we all will find the District of Columbia place in which we can live. For all of the time the city has had home rule, it has had an African-American mayor, and for most of the time, a majority African-American council. What do you see as the disadvantage 
of having a council that is not majority African American? Well, I think I just try to um, make it clear that people want to have their leadership reflect who they are. And the majority of the District of Columbia is still African American, 50% um, is African American, so there's a natural tendency to want your own. Besides people looking like the people they represent, Elissa Silverman, what do you think is important about that representation? Is there anything beyond race that people should be looking at in terms of their representation? Well, I think race is an important factor, Kojo, but I also think it's who benefits from someone being on the council, who benefits, uh, you know, do special interests benefit, do certain city contractors benefit. You know, I, as I, I've said before, I can't change what I look like, but I'm also not going to change my positions and my track record of working on things like affordable housing, like being down at the council, fighting for money for affordable housing, looking into our city's workforce development programs, working to improve our welfare to work programs, TANF programs to make sure people have opportunity. I have a track record of doing that. You wanted to comment on this, Matthew Fuhrman? Yeah, because I think what, what underlay the comment this morning is the sense that the growth in the city is benefiting some people and not benefiting all communities. And the theme of my campaign has been let's grow together. The idea is I think the growth in the city is exciting, but we absolutely have to make sure that it works for all of our communities and they feel like it works for all of our communities and they feel like the city's standing up for them. We all, many of us, took a tour on uh, Georgia Avenue this weekend and were shown by community activists on Georgia Avenue, all the different kinds of things that are being proposed. And those activists were African American, they were European American, they were talking in very excited terms about the things that could be coming for Georgia Avenue, but they also underscored the importance of including affordable housing in the things that were coming, including neighborhood serving retail. We can do this in a way that benefits all of our communities a council that's determined to do that, whether it's made up of majority African American or majority white, the key is that we be determined to serve the city as a whole. Patrick Mara, you're a representative of a newer family living in a place like Columbia Heights, one of those neighborhoods where there's been an explosion yes. of both commercial and residential development. I did not see a section from your website specifically dedicated to this issue from a public policy perspective, though. What can people like you do on the council to make sure that development benefits everybody from the seniors who've been living in places sure. like Columbia Heights for decades to the families like yours who are part of this new wave of residents? Well, I live uh, two blocks from that Georgia Avenue tour that we all took this past weekend. I live on 11th Street in Columbia Heights. I moved from uh, Ward 6 over there about 10 years ago. and one of the things that we, I think we have to be increasingly sensitive of is, uh, for example, on my street, all the residents, or primarily most of the residents who were living on my street when I moved there, are there still. But it's just that we filled in uh, houses, new residents have filled in houses that were crumbling, that were abandoned, uh, where folks were squatting in. Uh, but we need to, what we need to be increasingly sensitive of is housing, uh, particularly affordable housing. Uh, in addition to that, I, I think that when you look at the schools, I don't know that we're doing enough to really plan for the growing populations of uh, school children, particularly in Columbia Heights, Petworth, Ward 6. I mean, my, my wife and I, we're going to have a baby this fall, and we're probably not going to be able to live in my 900-square-foot residence anymore, so we will need to move at some point. Uh, the, the city needs to do a better job of looking at the mobility of its residents, particularly these new residents, because I think in many instances they're looking at these residents as people who will stay in that exact location. Um, and so housing is, is becoming an increasingly larger issue. So what, just to follow up on that, I mean, affordable housing sounds great. I think everyone mm -hmm. agrees the principle of affordable Absolutely. housing is good. But what specific tools would you use on the council to address this issue? So I think the most important fundamental thing we can do is to have a standalone committee that addresses just housing. Um, this is such a big issue. I served on a number of committees 
uh, or one committee related to the schools facilities and then other committees that were looking at obviously schools being the... But what would that member. committee do? I mean in, in terms of actual tools what can you do to help increase affordable housing? Sure well I think from uh, you know has been mentioned before I think when you're looking at uh, the rate of, of, of tax increase I think that needs to that should be lowered I think in some circumstances we need to look at the, t the tax increase on real estate. Sorry, I wasn't specific enough. Um, but we need to, to take a harder look at how, for example, when you're looking at how long a resident has been in the city, maybe we should examine way ways to uh, incentivize and make it easier for residents who have been living in the district for you know, 25 years, 30 years to stay in the District of Columbia because, you know, and you, we saw this over the, and I see this all the time since I live two blocks away, but with Georgia Avenue, either we can incentivize growth for the residents who are there now or there will be a groundswell of new residents who overtake Lower Georgia Avenue. And I think one of the most important things we can do is to incentivize growth for existing residents. Some of this goes to workforce development. Uh, you know, obviously that's a, that's a huge, huge issue. But as I said before, looking at entrepreneurship in the District of Columbia, this is entrepreneurship generally. These are opportunities that longer time residents have missed out on, and we need to we need to come into parity with uh, surrounding jurisdictions on how we tax and fee. And frankly, we need you know we need to bring back things like empowerment zones. Just wanted to ask the same question to Anita. Oh, sorry. Can I get in the yes. conversation? Mm -hmm. you, because you started out talking. I'm, I'm Perry Ray. For those who are listening and don't know, I'm right about <laughs> because I, I, I'm, I'm just I'm 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 insulted. Okay, Perry, go. I, go. I truly am. I'm insulted because this is the same dynamic that that blacks in this city talk about. I'm at the table with you having a conversation about the ask me talking about blacks in the city being under uh, underrepresented on council. Right. Seven of the 13 members in the council are white. The majority of the population of the city is black. And so what it, what what has happened is blacks, of course, feel like their voice is not going to be heard. If I it, think the last census is, shows that blacks are under 50 percent of 50, the population. 50.7, according to the census That's that right. I took off the website yesterday. There you go. Bro. So, uh, I, again, I feel insulted because what I say is is secondary. So uh, again, how is we, what you say second? Because I'm being corrected by 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 Kojo. It's not like I came unprepared. I didn't. I thought I it know was it looks slightly similar. under, and 50%. that's okay. That's okay. And and so my point is, this is the dynamic we have in the city where we're sitting at the table, and I'm 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 just taking notes at who the questions are, are directed to. So that's the, the dynamic we have in the city when you talk about gentrification. Matt Fruman alluded to who benefits. And, and, and who who's uh, who's suffering um, at the hands of this great growth right. that we have in the city. So Perry, what I'm asking though are specifics on this. I mean, mm -hmm. I, and we can go around the room and talk about how we want affordable housing, but where are the specifics? Sure, the specifics include inclusionary zoning, holding these developers accountable, but not adhering to the rules that are already in place, taking away their tax incentives. The city council doesn't have the political will to do that. That's why I'm running in this race, because no one is speaking for the underserved. I've seen, I, matter of fact, just yesterday, I saw a woman with two children turned away from the shelter saying that she was trying to get into a shelter with her children. We got 600 kids over at D.C. General living under deplorable, uh, uh, under deplorable conditions, but of course, those, you know, we, we, we are building these great and grand projects. When, when we walked down Georgia Avenue with the Georgia Avenue Development Task Force, we looked at two developments, right, 40, 40 uh, units in one, 30 in the other. And they suppose they have, at least by, by what the city council mandates, 30% of those units supposed to be affordable housing. Well, guess what? Two in one unit, uh, two in one building, and three in the other. That's a crime. And that we're executing against the most vulnerable people in this city. That's who I'm fighting for. Perry Red, allow me yes. to step back and have you answer the question that I put earlier about why do you think it is important for there to be a majority of black members on the council? And I'll tell you why I asked the question. The question I asked is because of the assumption that if a member of the council happens to be black, that member of the council will be an advocate for poor people. I don't happen to agree with that. Do you? Well, obviously not. Look at our council right now. We enjoy a four four hundred seventeen million dollar surplus. Oh my goodness, we're doing so wonderful in the city, uh, uh, fiscally speaking, but socially speaking, 
we're, 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 we're disenfranchising uh, the most vulnerable people. So what state. difference does it make if the membership of the council is majority black or white? Well, what difference it makes is this. Uh, we have a legacy in our country of, of treating people of color um, less than respectable. And so with, with this, uh, uh, with the, uh, the city council being a majority black, what we have is, is uh, the dynamic where uh, uh, Washingtonians are forced forced to look at the injustices that are executed against the most vulnerable. For example, the school closures. Look at the majority of the school closures. Fifteen schools are slated to be closed. In poor neighborhoods, most of them. In Ward 7 and 8, the majority in Ward 7 and 8. How many in Ward 2? How many in Ward 1? I know I don't hear anything. How many in Ward 3? No one will say. But the fact of the matter is, what we've learned from history, not just Washington's history, but America's history, that whites, when Europeans are in control of any elected uh, body, they do not care for the most vulnerable who happen to be people of color. So that is the chief reason why that's important. I wonder if I could also answer Paul that question. Zuckerberg. Uh, I'm a candidate fighting for fairness for young people and for development and the biggest impediment is jobs and the biggest impediment to jobs is criminal records and we're criminalizing many young people and they can't get jobs for silly things like possession of marijuana we're arresting twice as many young people in this city for possession of marijuana as we're graduating from high school these people can't get security clearances they can't work for the government they can't work for Metro. They can't even work as cleaning people in the downtown buildings because they don't have security clearances and they have criminal records. I want to decriminalize marijuana. I want to treat it as a civil offense and I don't want to lock people up. I don't want to give young people criminal records. I want to get them jobs and job training. You think we should do as they have done in the states of Washington and Colorado? No, I think we should do what they've done in Philadelphia, New York, Boston, Chicago, Detroit, change it from a criminal offense to a civil violation. It's still prohibited. Adults would pay a fine. Juveniles, it's parental Why notification. Why not go ahead and legalize it? Well, I don't think we're at that point yet, and legalization conflicts with federal law. Decriminalization does not. It would prevent over 6,000 young people, 9 to 1, black to white, mostly young black men, from having criminal records which prevents them from getting jobs, finding affordable housing, continuing their education. We've had a black majority council, we've had a black mayor, and they have done nothing to help these young people. They That's have right. put them on the road, not to college, but to the criminal justice system, and they're sending them to prison at incredible rates, usually out of state. Wanted to get back to development, Alyssa Silverman, so hold your thought. Maybe you can incorporate it in the answer to this question. When it comes to commercial development, what should the city be trying to attract, and what should the council be doing to make that happen? There was just a debate on the council about whether the city should require big box retailers like Walmart to pay higher taxes. How would you have voted on the plan? A lot of people in the district want cheaper, affordable big box options, regardless of the politics associated with, say, Walmart. So I do support uh, requiring big box stores to pay a living wage. Uh, and, you know, we have other retailers, large retailers that do so. Costco just moved into Ward 5 and they pay a living wage. Uh, this bill is geared toward Walmart uh, largely and I think that it's the most profitable company in the world should pay a living wage so that uh, because there are costs to our city if they don't if people have to rely on public assistance for health care uh, if they can't support their families and rent an apartment then we end up paying a cost as a city so I think it's to our advantage uh, to pass this bill now let me talk a little bit about the affordable housing issue I am running to be an at-large council member I think this question is a key question about the differences between the candidates. My, I believe we use government as a tool to make strategic investments in our city that are going to help us grow and help us mature as a city. Uh, so here are the tools that I would uh, make those investments in. The Housing Production Trust Fund. 
year after year these past few years the housing production trust fund has been raided and I have been down at the Wilson building saying that I think this is an important investment. What is the housing production trust fund? What should it be doing? Well, I think it should, so it is a, a fund that's tied to basically uh, property sales and a certain percentage, 15% goes to this fund that's used to, 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 it's largely been used to build affordable housing. I think it also should be used to maintain affordable housing. One of the issues that uh, we saw when we were on Georgia Avenue is that that area is rapidly changing and there was a big story in the post. I Should uh, the Trout Report indicate that one of you your big campaign supporters was involved in corruption in affordable housing. I mean, you're giving money to people, uh, but uh, Which you're not. Which uh, big supporter would that be? Uh, yes. The Trout Report says that uh, uh, Mr. Skinner, who was your big backer, uh, was uh, getting uh, 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 what was it, five hundred thousand uh, dollars from uh, uh, engineering work that wasn't necessary or was duplicative and. Uh, you know, so it's great that you're spending this money around, but you're just throwing it around on your friends and supporters. Okay, I, Kojo, I think there's no evidence of that. I answered your question earlier, which is, first of all, I don't think that the council should be involved in contracts. So if Mr. Skinner had a contract... Why would you accept money from someone who was singled out in the trial report as having gotten taxpayer money that he didn't deserve? Why would you legitimize that person? So as I answered before, Paul, and I'm happy to answer it again, there are many people who have given me money from the development community, from the nonprofit world. I've reported on them. I haven't written flattering things about them, and they've given me. Why don't you me return it if, they, if the person is implicated in contracting shenanigans? Why don't you return that money and say you're not interested in that type of supporter? Because, Paul, he gave that money to me because he believes that I'm honest and fair and ethical. But he's and, not. Yeah. Don't but he's kid not. yourself. But he's not. Don't kid yourself. That's I don't think that the issue, you know, let me say that I was answering a question about affordable housing, and I think it's this type of polarizing and trying to trick people. I just people. had a question. No, it's trying question. to trick people, Paul. Did you accept and the money from yes, them I or did. not? Yes, I did. I'm very the clear report? about that. And okay, I think that as a that large before. council member, our my this is how I view our role is to make good investments in our people. I believe in investing in the housing production trust fund. I believe in in being honest and funding things like there is a property tax credit for renters and homeowners right now that would help low and moderate income homeowners and renters that the council passed but didn't fund. I don't think that's honest. I believe in tax using tax policy to do things to help people. I think that's a key difference between the people sitting at this table. Paul Zuckerberg, have you gone over the 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 campaign reports of all of the members here and checked out everybody who you felt was suspicious who contributed to their campaigns? Or are you really mad because somebody who is in her campaign challenged your signatures? I'm not mad about that. I'm mad about that she said that people who live in homeless shelters can't sign signatures. I'm mad that mm -hmm. she said that uh, uh, she knew that I had enough signatures uh, of registered voters, but she used what she learned in her I-70 to try to knock opponents, Mr. Settles and I, off the ballot. So, so that's what we were really talking about. <laughs> no. Yes, I thought that was what we were really right. talking about, but here's Patrick Matt. I just wanted to, to get back on this affordable housing question, because I still haven't <clears throat> heard an answer, um, sort of what the council, if as we're talking about making sure people can stay in the neighborhoods that they live in, when rents start going up. What, can what can the council do? Yeah. Um, if, Ms. Anita. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, this morning before um, arriving here, we were receiving a briefing from the mayor. And I was of, watching it on Channel 13. Yes. All right. One of the things that was very um, telling, um, he talked about building and preserving a 10,000 units of affordable housing by 2020. But he also went on to talk about additional um, millions, $13.1 million. And of course, uh, this is how it breaks out um, 3 million for new project and sponsored Bates local rent supplement slots. Now, local rent supplement slots actually helps the tenants. And, and that's what I'd like to see more than the three. 
three million put in there into that and that's for those persons who are at zero to thirty percent of AMI um, additionally the one million for home purchase assistance that's a down payment uh, monies that we give and then the rapid rehousing another million and then another million for uh, emergency rental assistance and then victim service um, housing the problem is that these are a tiny amounts they are a million dollars a million dollars a million dollars I really think one of the things that we have that we have to use is we have to really buy into the rental market we will have to go in and lease up X number of units if we're going to get families, large families, out of the shelters. And that's the condition that we're faced with. We are at a point in the society of the District of Columbia when we're flush with cash. Let's use some of that money to get some people out of poverty. And that's where I am. And that's my, that is my number one issue. And I am an African-American black candidate. And I'm proud of having that as my issue. Thank you. May, may I? Because this is Matthew Freeman. And I actually think that many of the candidates share a lot of views on this subject. We are at a place where we are in an increasingly strong fiscal position. We need to signal to all of our communities that we want to help them to stay and be able to afford to live in our communities. The Housing Production Trust Fund, Alyssa Silverman has been an advocate for it for a long time. I think all of us are advocates for it. The hundred million dollars is a start. It's a very important way to get it done. Some of us have talked about property tax relief for seniors. If you've lived in your home for a certain number of years, let's not push people out based on a property increasing property taxes. I put on the table the idea of a voucher program, $500 a month to teachers, firefighters, and police to pay rent or a mortgage in the district. Let's make it more affordable for the people who work in the city, who serve us to live in the city. The rent supplement program is another one. Let's use the strength of our economy to help all of our people and preserve the fabric. I think many of us are committed to it. I don't think it's a thing that is a huge difference, but let's make it happen. I've heard people say, and you know, we do traffic and rumor on this broadcast, that they're having a difficult time trying to figure out what essentially is the difference between Matthew Fruman and Alyssa Silverman. What would that difference be? Uh, okay, I do get asked this question, and I actually think I heard uh, we we uh, and I try to answer this question honestly. I, somebody asked me this question the other day, and they said, "You know, you gave uh, that was a very credible answer." Uh, Alyssa is an investigative reporter. Her she came up as an investigative reporter. She is committed to when you see the answers that she offers. She says, "I'm going to ask the hard questions." I'm going to get to the bottom of things. I think that's part of where she comes from and I think there is a role for that on the City Council. I'm not going to say there's no role for that on the City Council. I am a community activist. I've worked inside of the schools to try to make schools better. I've worked on the ANC to try to solve problems. I'm a person who gets things done, moves things forward, builds coalitions to get them done. That doesn't mean I would never get to the bottom of anything and it doesn't mean Alyssa Silverman would never put things together to push things forward but our fundamental orientations, my fundamental orientation is a person who gets things done, pushes things forward and elevates the tone of the discussion. Mr. Silverman, is this a distinction without a difference? <laughs> no, I think there is a difference. I, I think Matt and I share uh, a certain philosophical goals but there is a difference in leadership. Let me talk about one thing which I think shows that difference in leadership. The city right now is piloting a very innovative job matching program called the Workforce Intermediary and that is largely due to the work that I did in coalition with other nonprofit groups and working with the council and the mayor to get legislation passed for a task force to be formed and now the mayor is at the the great administration is actually piloting it I think that's a key distinction and difference its leadership on campaign finance reform when I first began this campaign everyone said I was crazy for not accepting corporate contributions because I couldn't run a viable campaign well I think 
I, you know, and I'm asking listeners and district residents not to buy into this bogus conventional wisdom. I've run an extremely viable campaign. I haven't taken corporate money. And I think that there's a lot of bogus conventional wisdom in this campaign. If you'll allow me one more, Patrick, madam, this one for Perry Red and, and Patrick Mara, and then it's all yours. <laughs> what about the kinds of businesses the city should no longer want? Tommy Wells took a lot of heat after the recent shooting on North Capitol Street when he initially said that nightclubs were no longer compatible in a neighborhood like that one. What did you make of that statement, Perry Red? Well, I saw it as uh, paternalistic. Um, community residents decide what it is they need. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I advocate for a citizen led legislative drafting as part of my platform. The fact of the matter is this, that um, violence um, is, is unhealthy to any, any part of the, uh, the body politic. So addressing the roots, hopefully Tommy Wells would not consider running for mayor because if, if that paternalistic type of thinking is where he's going to go, especially when we're talking about um, black people in this city who are um, underrepresented um, when it comes to the, the fiscal makeup. You know, 28% of our uh, firms in the city are, are black owned when we're 50% of the population. And those, those numbers are problematic. But um, what types of, and back to your question, what types of businesses should communities not want? It's not for us to say, you know, in, in a capitalist society, um, freedom of association and, and freedom of your pursuits, um, it should be the rule. Now, what's healthy for particular communities? We have 144 designated communities in the city. So to say that one city shouldn't have a printing, uh, you know, a printing company and another one shouldn't have a flower business um, is, is irresponsible of us. So um, to speak to that, um, I, I just think Tommy Wells, and I'm glad he rethought it because he came back and, and, and he, he backtracked, and that's good. And your turn, Patrick Mara. And by the way, would you support the use of funds, public funds, to help DC United build a new stadium? Uh, I think you would need for the DC United question. Obviously, I think you'd need to see a plan. I think it's a more, I think it's more realistic than since it has, it's more than just ten games a year. I think it's a bit more realistic. Um, but really, you would have to see that plan. Uh, I'm generally supportive, but until you can see the economics of a proposal, it's tough to say that you support or oppose it. Um, with regard to your previous question, um, I think it speaks most to the need to the need to diversify our economic footprint in the District of Columbia. Um, as I've said numerous times, or a couple times on this show, and I say it just about every community forum that I'm at. Um, we do a very poor job of small business in the District of Columbia. And we are, we are heading in a direction where we're going to be in the land of big box retailers and franchises in the neighborhoods where you don't have a massive, massive economic footprint. And so we need to do a much better job of incentivizing small business. Uh, Virginia is just about the best place in America to do business. Tyson's Corner is now the population center. So if you're an entrepreneur looking at D.C. or the metropolitan area as an, as an opportunity to do business, you're much more likely to go to Virginia and you're more likely to even go to Maryland. And this also speaks for the need of you know, even something like small business incubators east of the river. This speaks to the need for workforce development programs that actually work. Um, and these are the things that we need to focus on and we need to make sure that folks who have been here for generations have opportunities and some of these opportunities should be through entrepreneurship. And just to get back to sort of what Patrick you, you would do on the council, tax breaks, tax incentives, tax so, abatements, do, would you, do you support the use of these economic development tools offering breaks to businesses to come in to come into yeah. DC especially considering just how hot you know whether it's the real estate market right now or all the different industries would you support that it 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 depends on the project but certainly it's a it's a way to incentivize that growth but let me give you an example east of the river with St Elizabeth's uh, homeland security most of those jobs at Homeland Security will be taken by folks who can get security clearances, will be folks coming in from out of town who may have master's degrees. And so what can we do around that facility that encourages entrepreneurship? As you know, with the multiplier effect, you know, a small business is more likely to employ 
uh, residents of a community, neighbors, and this is why I think we do need to do a much better job of really honing in on, on small business and making ourselves more competitive with neighboring jurisdictions because right now we're, we are losing. And uh, Anita, just sort of on this question, you've worked uh, with, with Fort Myer and obviously there are, key, there are continual problems. And, and other businesses. And other businesses, mm -hmm. the city's yeah. CBE, prob the CBE program, which tries to encourage smaller local firms to get involved, to get into contracting. What do you see as, as, as the, the biggest issue with that program and what needs to be changed? Oh my goodness, um, I've heard from the uh, CBE community for years um, and it's been pretty much the same kind of complaint. Um, we, we are here and we don't get any, any action, we don't get any business. And of course, um, it's several reasons for that as you well know. Um, there's a classification um, issue uh, with some of the businesses. There are issues with um, businesses being in the wrong business um, and not showing that they have the capacity. And then there are businesses that do have the capacity, but they just are not selected. Um, and I think Vincent Orange has done a very good job of pointing out that even the district government doesn't always use DC-based businesses. I'd like to get in some questions from our listeners. We will go to Daniel in Northeast Washington who has a specific development project in mind. Daniel, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Kojo. Um, we started talking about the imbalances in the city and you know, if you're in Upper Northwest, you have Rock Creek Park, you can go walking in the woods, you can take your dog and bicycle and trails, and it's a, uh, uh, you know, there's... No, but enough about Bruce Johnson. Go ahead, please. Yeah, where Bruce Johnson lives, exactly. And um, obviously, the, the middle of the city and the eastern side of the city have much less outdoor recreational opportunities. So as the city has warehoused, fenced off the McMillan Parks and is pushing development to basically erase the emerald necklace of parks that were planned to, to spread the you know, natural benefits and recreation areas throughout the city. So we're, we're, we're wondering, with, a, with a, an obvious campus and, and reserve like the McMillan Reservoir, 113 acres, including the sand filtration plant, which was a park. Okay. You know, we're looking for a city council member who will champion, who will be brave enough to not just go along and get along with the uh, development community, which is all you've talked about today, why everybody just goes along and gets along, and really let's talk about the real issues other than, than packing the city with development, there is more to planning. What is your specific city. question, though, Daniel? Well, where, where is the city council member or a candidate, uh, whether the existing ones or your potential candidates, to champion a, a renaissance of a park at McMillan, a, a campus for families, for youth, for education? I mean, we have Glen Echo. Any specific ideas around this table on McMillan Park. Well, you know, uh, Tony Norman was, uh, is, is a champion for McMillan Park and and laid out the plan for, for D.C. residents to see. He did a tour and went around the city and, um, you know, I, I like what, 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 what uh, Daniel just alluded to, the whole thing about um, us running in this race. Perry Red, by the way. I'm sorry, Perry Red, yeah. And, and that goes or speaks to the heart of us running in this race. You know, we, in my case, it's a party principle that we don't take developer money, lobbyist money, because we believe in the purity of those who serve in the office. And uh, just for Daniel's sake, Daniel, consider doing something different and getting it right. Um, you know, 12 of the 13 members of our council are Democrats, and they've neglected y y what you're talking about right there. So you have in me a candidate, someone who is championing for other than big money developing. You know, you chase the money, um, nine times out of ten, you know, you're going you're gonna to get burnt. i got to move to another caller with any more specific suggestions about <laughs> McMillan Reservoir development. Well, I did submit uh, when Gabe Klein was at the Department of Transportation uh, a path to connect uh, the uh, through bike lanes across the area, the hospital areas, and through McMillan Reservoir because uh, 
it's almost impossible to bike from from Georgia Avenue over to the Catholic University area, uh, and it'd be important to have pedestrian and bike lanes in that area. Got this email from Marcus Rosenbaum. I'm eagerly awaiting hearing how the candidates stand on proposals to reduce the number of parking spaces required in new residential apartment houses. I'll put that to you, Matthew Fruman, because we're sitting across the street from what used to be Babe's Billiards, in which there's <laughs> going to be a new apartment building that will not have parking spaces, and you were one of the architects of that. Mm. Uh, yes, thank you for the question. Uh, the Babe's project was one we said at every step along the way. This isn't a test case for the zoning rewrite, where the idea of eliminating parking minimums is on the table. And what we did on the Babes project, it was a very specific project at a very specific site with the, with the uh, setup of the building as it was. And we talked with members of the community, we talked with the nearby neighbors, we tried to figure out what was the best use of that building. And we came to the conclusion that using the ground floor as a restaurant as opposed to a parking garage made the most sense. As we did that, we required the developer to have parking off-site within 500 feet. We required the developer to give zip car memberships to each new resident, capital bike share memberships to each new resident, a transit subsidy to encourage the residents to use the transit system. We required them to prohibit and the <coughs> residents from getting a parking permit to park on the nearby streets. The lesson of that for me was that you shouldn't just eliminate parking minimums. If you're going to reduce a parking minimum, you should have a plan for how you're going to deal with that so that you protect the nearby neighbors. So this is one I think we did a really good job. And when we came in front of the Zoning Commission on this at the first instance, they were very skeptical of the idea. And when we came in with our memorandum of understanding, our ANC had supported it unanimously and the Zoning Commission supported it unanimously and said this is like nothing we've ever seen. This is an incredible piece of work that you've undertaken to sort this out and make it work in a way that can benefit the most people and that will create an increased vibrancy on the Wisconsin Avenue corridor. So yes we did the right thing on babes but no don't just eliminate the parking minimums because then you will never have the leverage to do the kinds of things that we did. Lately a lot of the conversations about transportation and parking and Daniel thank you for your call those conversations have given way to racially coded debates about who the city's public policies are designed to serve. Let's start from the philosophical perspective. How do you think the city can encourage public transit walking, biking, and the like, without alienating the people throughout the city who legitimately need vehicles for their everyday lives or for their jobs. First, you, Anita Bartlett. Oh, that is a um, hot potato because transportation is on the tip of everybody's tongue, really. Uh, when I visit with seniors, they're talking about the lack of transportation. They want transportation that's at their doorstep um, because they can't get around. Uh, when I talk to young people, you know, they like the subway and, and what have you. Um, we are, uh, uh, we have to face it that we're landlocked um, as a community and that means that we have to have a variety of, of sources of transportation. Um, but trying to get along is making it increasingly difficult. I feel that we have bike lanes that are now going through residential neighborhoods. That works only when you get to, uh, when you're going through the neighborhood, once you get to the main corridors, you have a real difficult time. Um, it sounds glamorous that we can have um, all modes of transportation, but it really doesn't work very well yet. And I'm, I'm looking forward to um, taking a closer look at the Department of Transportation's plans. Now we're saying we're also going to start and have streetcars and now there are questions about where do the cars park. Uh, we already have the issue of where do the cars park when uh, we have churches on Sunday. So we're becoming a very densely populated community and I'm not sure that Washington DC, the streets of this nation's capital, the street 
of the District of Columbia are really designed for these many modes of transportation, which seem to be needed. Do you think that there are too much emphasis right now on, on bike lanes and these cycle tracks that have been put in downtown and D.C.? Streetcars, yeah. Well, I, I, think the, I think all of the transportation modes that we have now are a condition of progress. And it's not that it's, it's too much now, but it, it is here. And so I'm one of the persons that believes that you have to manage what you have, the situation that you have. And it does require people having a little more understanding. I mean, I, I, I worry about the bikelists because bikelists don't seem to feel they have any rules out there and they've got to be careful. I mean, it's, it, it's a hazard out there and not everyone is compromising and willing to let a bike pass, you know. <laughs> this is Paul Zuckerberg. I think sure. DDOT has it all wrong. I don't think that the bike facilities they're putting in are appropriate and they're not in the right places. Uh, they say that they have traffic calming features. The traffic may be calm, but the drivers sure aren't. <laughs> uh, bike paths need to be in on other routes because when you take away vehicle lanes, uh, it causes uh, tension between the uh, drivers and the vehicles and the facilities have just bike facilities have been added haphazardly without any real plan so we need to get the bikers and the motorists together DDOT needs to synchronize the traffic lights to speed up uh, motorists which every other major city seems to do except us and we have to understand that we're going to have motorists we're going to have bikers it's great but we got to get the people Bikers, motorists, and DDOT on the same page, and they're not right now. Allow me to go to David in Ward 4 in D.C. David, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Yeah, hi. This is David Schwartzman. Uh, I've had a long-term uh, advocacy regarding taxes and budget issues for the State of Green Party. Yep. And uh, I just want to briefly reflect on the mayor's proposed budget. No new taxes. And uh, child care is underfunded, homeless services are underfunded in a number of other areas. And yet we have a tax structure in D.C. where the top 1% of families earning about $2.5 million a year are paying the lowest tax rate of anyone, a little over 6%. The uh, working class families, $50,000 a year, are paying 11%. And we learn, I'll, I'll conclude, uh, we learned about just a few weeks ago that homeless children going to a shelter were turned away because they had a lack of funding. Uh, I direct this question to Perry Red, but I'd like to hear what Patrick Mara has to say. Uh, one of the strongest. Allow me to have Perry Red respond first, Patrick Mara second, and then I got a quote from Elizabeth Silverman to add to it. But first, you, Perry Red. <laughs> I mean, Elisa <laughs> Silverman. Uh, first of all, thank you, Professor Swartzman. Um, strong supporter of the Redford Council campaign. Uh, real simple this that our campaign supports a progressive tax structure. Um, when we talk about progressives in the city, in this race, um, we are truly progressive. We are asking the, the top 2% to pay a greater uh, and a fair share of their income in taxes and take the burden off the middle income earners in particular who play, pay upwards of 11%. Your turn, Patrick. Great. Uh, well, I've uh, briefly had an opportunity to kind of examine the budget, and one of the things that concerns me is the budget is up 23% in the last two years. Um, so I do, I will be that member of the council is taking a harder look at spending. I mean, the D.C. government budget is up 23% in two years, and how is everyone else's budget in the District of Columbia? How is everyone's household budgets? It's not up 23%. The D.C. public schools budget, I've been on the uh, D.C. State Board of Education now, representing Ward 1 for over two years now, and it concerns me that that increase is only 1%, but the overall budget is up 23%. And so I just like to, that's an area, obviously, one of my big focuses will be education, both D.C. public schools, D.C. public charter schools, and, you know, I'll be that, not only that fiscal and ethical watchdog, but that leading voice of education reform as well. Alyssa Silverman, I'd like you to clarify something that was in the Washington Post this morning. You were quoted as saying, I don't think D.C. voters mind paying taxes. What they mind are bad services, and I think the voters want an honest, transparent approach to taxation. 
What does honest, transparent approach mean then in practical terms? Well, what I, I was on this program, Kojo, about two years ago when my organization, DC Fiscal Policy, instituted a poll. And that's exactly what our mm -hmm. poll found, which is that district residents don't mind paying taxes. What they mind is that they're, we're not getting the outcomes that we should for the tax dollars that we pay. Uh, and we have a $10 billion budget. We should be getting better outcomes. One of the things that I want to do on the council is really drill down, and I have the skill set, I think, to do that, as I've said, in workforce development. We spend a lot of money on programs to try to get some of our hardest to employ residents into work, but it's not paying off. They're not getting into jobs. I think we need to look, and oversight is important. That's what you're, I think we're electing a council member to do is take a look at a program like the transitional employment program where we're spending 8.2 million dollars a year in our local dollars that's supposed to lead to employment for some of our hardest to employ residents and we're not getting there. Patrick Madden. And, and Alyssa, just following up on that, is there any tax or fee right now in the district government that you think is too high? Well, I, you know, I do hear from um, small businesses, uh, but, you know, their complaint, the complaint, biggest complaint I hear is about DCRA and how difficult it is to do business with the district. Now, as you know, Patrick, there is a tax revision commission that's meeting right now, and it's led by Mayor Williams. Uh, I know many of the people on the commission. I follow the commission's work, and they're analyzing right now our tax, taking a comprehensive view of our tax structure and tax policy. And now if the Tax Revision Commission came back and said, we think we should lower taxes, you know, one thing I mentioned before is that I support uh, a uh, Schedule H, which is this uh, tax break to lower the income level for uh, a tax break on property for both renters and homeowners. And I'm afraid that's just about all the time we have in this broadcast so far because I'd like to make sure that we reintroduce every single member of this panel who is an at-large candidate before they go so they will have the opportunity to have you hear their names one more time. Patrick Madden is not a candidate. He is our co-moderator today. He's a reporter who covered D.C. politics. The other I, I am Williams. wearing a, a, stick, a little sticker, though, yeah, like I the candidates. I, I noticed that. Patrick, thank you so much for joining us. Anita Bonds currently holds the at-large seat up for election on April 23rd. She's a Democrat. Anita Bonds, thank you for joining us. Good luck to you. Thank you very much. Matthew Fruman is also a Democratic candidate for the council. Matthew Fruman, thank you for joining us. Good luck to you. Thanks for having me. Patrick Mara, he is a Republican candidate. Patrick Mara, thank you for joining us. Good luck to you. Thank you, Kojo. Perry Red, he is the statehood Green Party candidate. Perry Red, thank you for joining thank us. Thank you, Kojo Good and Pat. Paul Zuckerberg is an at-large candidate. He's, of course, running for this seat. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you Good for having me, Kojo, and also Pat. Alyssa Silverman is a Democratic candidate. Did you give up your social life to run for this office? Or <laughs> did you have I'm a social life to begin with? I'm happy that this has come up, Kojo. <laughs> <laughs> we always have to bring up Alyssa Silverman's social life in these books. She is a Democratic candidate for the council, running for an at-large seat. Alyssa, thank you for joining us. Good luck to you. Thank you very much. And thank you all for listening. Make sure you all either vote absentee or show up on April 23rd at the polls and have your voice heard. Make your voice heard. Thank you all for listening. I'm Kojo Nandi. Yeah.